in general today of recent PhDs. Both finished their PhDs in 2013. Right? Go back to the same 14. Time. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Very end of 2013 and beginning of right. Yeah, um, uh, Roberta is from Italy. Yitzke is from the Netherlands. Uh, Roberta is now in England. Yitzke is here in Spain. <laughs> so they are uh, the, the prime example of the mobility that's needed today, the background, <coughs> the multiple languages, and with really interesting focus in their research on women in the Middle Ages and Central and Early Middle Ages. So we thought that these two go very well together and will give us a um, good opportunity to have a discussion that takes both of your talks uh, afterwards. So Yitzka will give her presentation first, then Roberta, and then we'll have time for discussion and debate afterwards. Um, Yitzka Jasperse uh, just began here at the Thesik in January, mid-January, right? So two months now, um, with a Juan de la Cierva for Formación um, postdoc, that's a Spanish National uh, Research Fellowship, and if I'm not mistaken, she's the only uh, foreigner to get this at, in the humanities? Mm. No, possibly, yeah, very small number. Yeah, it's, it's a very small number. Yeah, so it's, these, the, the fellowships that each of them has is a very competitive one, and when you're coming in from the outside, you have that double uh, competition that you have to be able to prove that not only are you that good in your own land, but you can be that much better when you're being scrutinized from the outside. So both of them really have done something that we are hoping the rest of you also will be doing once you finish your PhDs. Um, Yitzke's dissertation was titled The Many Faces of Duchess Matilda, Matronage, Motherhood, and Mediation in the 12th Century. And she looked at manuscripts and literature and coins to try to pull together information about a woman for whom there is very little documentary evidence. Um, she'll be giving us a bit about what her background is and her research and then where she's going with this. Um, Roberta's dissertation was entitled Italian Queens in the 9th and 10th Centuries. And these queens also, the documentation that I think you've had to pull together from different types of written sources. And do you use visual evidence? Uh, I use coins. Bit. Coins as well, mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Um, so there is going to be a nice overlap with the two of them. Her fellowship is a Leverhulm Early Career Fellowship at the University of Nottingham. I'm going to pass around both of their CVs so that you can see the types of publications they're working on now, the places that they've been giving talks, and also the teaching experience that both of them have gotten, which is really useful, very helpful, and I assume on, um, something that will stand you in good stead in the future. Pass those around. On that end, leave that one on. The, yeah, yeah, I'll sure. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, you're all right. Yeah, okay. this is the talk of today is let's talk about sex, and I have to admit it's way less exciting than Salt and Pepper <laughs> suggested in their song. So um, um, it's about past and present research, and uh, the running thread is uh, women and gender. And um, I think that uh, both can be connected to treasures. And I will be f uh, first be talking about coins and seals. And, I, well, you can consider them treasures as well, coins for their material value, and uh, they often found in hoards where they were stored. And seals may be a bit more private treasures, but as they embodied, or uh, were the embodiments of the owners, the owners took very good care of them and prevented them to be used by others. And there are many examples of um, cat fights over the use of seals, which I will not be uh, discussing. But uh, after uh, the, uh, my presentation on coins and seals, I will be saying something about a present research which is related to Therese's research on treasuries. Okay, let's see if this is okay. Um, oh, by the way, the poster, or a part of the poster, is taken from this image. It's a uh, the Gospel Book of Henry the Lion, who is depicted here, and his wife Matilda. And Matilda uh, was the daughter of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, so quite a famous person. Um, and I will not be talking about this manuscript, um, maybe because it's a bit too evident to talk about it, because it's nice, it looks good, it has colors, and it's attracted lots of attentions, and um, the manuscript is 
in Wolfenbüttel and is only uh, taken out of the um, library there once every two years because uh, they, really, uh, well, they won't, don't want it to be damaged. Uh, but what it does demonstrate is women's participation or inclusion in medieval culture and also in visual culture. And what we see here is that Henry and Matilda donate the book, I hope you can see it, to the Virgin. Uh, they symbolically donate it to the Virgin because in reality they donated the book to a church, the uh, church at Brunswick where they uh, also lived and what was their most famous residence. Well, um, here is uh, here stated that it's uh, Duke Henry and Matilda, just Matilda, and then here in the corner the Duquesa uh, suggesting that she's a duchess, but she's wearing a crown as well, and this is a reference to her royal status, which is emphasized in the manuscript a few other times as well. Well, sumptuous art have attracted a lot of attention, especially if they contain a small narrative such as this image. Less attention has been paid to coins, uh, at least by art historians. Uh, these are not Henry and Matilda, but uh, Sophia uh, and uh, Albrecht, also from uh, Germany. And they're also depicted as uh, noble uh, a noble knight and a noble uh, lady. Um, um, Albrecht is in armor, is holding a shield and a, a large lance. And Sophia is wearing a, like a similar mantle to uh, Matilda and is also holding the uh, lance. Um, this can be found in the uh, coin cabinet in Berlin and it's worth a visit. It's also worth reading the text on the website because it only mentions, or it mainly mentions Albrecht and not so much his wife Sophia. And then uh, they completely ignore the fact that Sophia is also touching the lens that Albrecht is uh, holding. And this raises a lot of questions. What do these coins communicate? And where were these coins found? And what can they tell us about the people that are depicted on them? One of these coins is found, uh, was found in Albrecht's grave and from that the conclusion was drawn that Albrecht must have loved his wife very much and that a to as a token of appreciation for her, the coin ended up in his grave. Sounds um, a bit romantic and I'm not sure if that was a medieval idea as well. I think that the fact that Sophia is depicted on this coin and holds the uh, lance or the banner uh, should be well, should be looked at uh, more carefully than has been done so far. Um, at least it shows us the visualization of gender and also definitions of masculinity and femininity and perhaps it also tells us something about women's participation in politics. I've been looking at in my own research as well. Um, this is a coin type where Henry and Matilda are depicted. Henry over here, Matilda here. And this is a seal uh, uh, owned by Bertha of Lorraine. And uh, what I've been doing is in my PhD research, I've been foc uh, focusing on this coin type. And um, in the past, it has been suggested that this was uh, made um, as in commemoration of the wedding of Henry and Matilda. Well, there's uh, no evidence for this, but of, as you know, that evidence in the Middle Ages can uh, pose a problem and I have um, looked at the coin more carefully and I hope you can see that both hold a scepter and um, I've studied then I started looking at women holding scepters and then I found out that when they are depicted that way it's never meaningless they're always it always concerns women in positions of power and for Sarah, it will be important to know that, or interesting to know that Etonian women were depicted with scepters as well. And um, if you look at the charter evidence or uh, other narratives, um, it suggests that these were powerful women. And uh, taking all the evidence I could find concerning Matilda together, I suggested that we are looking here at a co-rule, so a more active participation 
by Matilda in Henry's rule, and that then you think, okay, if this idea holds true, when would they have issued this coin type? And I suggest that they did it uh, when Henry the Lion embarked to the Holy Land and Matilda remained in uh, Brunswick. Um, there's no evidence that she um, ruled alone. Uh, it's more likely that she functioned as a regent. She was 16 years by that time with the support of uh, Henry's vessels. He had two important uh, persons staying behind and they supported her, as we know from a chronicle. Um, if you want to uh, know more about this and other uh, examples of women and scepters, I've published on this in the Haskell Society Journal. Um, then, um, during my research on Matilda, I briefly mentioned Judith and uh, Bertha, her contemporaries, and then um, I decided to um, yeah, take a better look at these two women, their sisters, and they're also the sisters of Frederick Barbarossa, the, empo uh, the emperor in the 12th century. And I thought there must be more to these images of women and coins and seals than has been uh, acknowledged so far. Um, if you, okay, this is, I probably will have a debate about this with Therese, but this is Bertha's seal. It, um, I'm, as an art historian, I'm not allowed to make sort of uh, aesthetic judgments, but I would say that it's not a really nicely executed image. The, it's a, a woman on horseback. The horse is really tiny and her legs are really long. But, and she's holding a bird in her, uh, what I think, left hand, and with her right hand she holds the horse. But what is interesting, and this is the reason why I should go to the archive to see this image myself, that it looks like she's not riding side saddle as was usual for uh, women um, on uh, seals. And it's actually interesting that Janet Nelson in an article suggests, in a note suggests, women on horseback is a topic that should be studied in more detail because there are many questions about how women uh, rode horses. And then she said, okay, I've been looking it up on the web and you have to go through a lot of romantic bullcrap to, uh, well, get a glimpse of what women how women used to ride their horses, but it will be interesting to find out more. If the idea is true that uh, Bertha is not riding side saddle, this suggests that she's riding as a man, although not depicted in armor and not holding a sword or a lance, she is uh, depicted in a masculine way, and this would fit in nicely with what we know about uh, Bertha, because um, she was her husband, Matthew of Lorraine, um, considered her a trustworthy person, so he left a lot of uh, politics in her hands, and she also played a big part in the uh, politics of her sons. This is one example. This is the same seal, and I think what I've encountered as a major problem, both with seals and coins, is that they're in archives, and that the basic information is there, but there's never any note on how many other seals have been found, where you can find them. So as far as I know, we have only one seal of Bertha, and it's attached, appended to this charter, which she issued together with her son Simon. It's a, a grant to uh, Clairvaux, the Abbey of Clairvaux. This is the seal of her son, who is like a typical knight on horseback with a sword and a shield, and um, as you can see, uh, Ego uh, Simon, and then he first mentions himself, and then his mother is mentions, mentioned as Illustris Mater Mea Berta. Um, while, what I find interesting is that, okay, he mentions his mother, so that's interesting, he, he was probably the one instigating the grant or thinking about the grant, but he included his mother. Uh, he, his seal is appended to the middle of the parchment, suggesting that it was the most important seal. But if you think along the lines of Brigitte Bedeau-Rezac, 
with the symbolic value and the semiotic value of seals, then he's actually following his mother, because she's, she's hanging here, and then you get the idea about a sort of visual cooperation between uh, a son and his mother. Um, what I've also done by studying Goethe is um, in lots of literature you still find the idea that mothers favored one son over the other, so often the eldest or, well, one of the many she had. And actually this was also thought about Berta and what I've done by looking at the charter material as well, um, I found out that she, fa she did not favor one son over another, she just favored them differently. So she helped all of them, but in different uh, ways. Um, so I think what I've done is looking at Bertha's motherly authority, um, but I think lots of what she could do, she was, yeah, she could do things because she was a mother, as a mother, she had um, uh, possibilities, but she probably also had possibilities because she worked in close cooperation with her husband. So her husband trusted her, that trust was evident to her children, so they trusted her as well to work with them. And what all probably also helped was her relation to Frederick Barbarossa, which you encounter also in Foberta in uh, some of uh, the um, charters, but especially for her sister Judith, who was in Thuringia, there you see a lot of reference to the emperor. Okay, so this is basically what I've been doing so far, and um, well, you're all working on medieval stuff, so I don't have to convince you that medieval stuff is interesting. I hope I've convinced you, if you're not working on seals and coins, that they are also really worthwhile. But <coughs> what I will be doing, which is actually not my project, but Therese's project about um, the medieval treasury across from, uh, frontiers and generations, and I already got a comment from a colleague in Germany saying, oh, is it, does it also include violence and women? So, uh, probably because of the uh, frontiers that suggests that there will be conflicts as well. And I've not thought about it that way, but um, um, it's a project that will um, focus on uh, the kingdom of uh, Leon and uh, Castel, but of Castilia, and I've taken from Therese's project description um, a general idea um, that for its great richness in both objects and written sources, the treasury of San Isidoro functions in the present project as a jumping off point to examine larger questions about sumptuary collections in the kingdom of Leon Castilla during the central middle ages. And I have added some um, ideas or some topics that relate to this general idea that Therese uh, posed. And uh, I think that Therese will be looking into quite a lot of these as well. But um, I was thinking that questions concerning a project um, can include uh, donors. Hi. So their status, their gender, um, their, their relations to the receiving institutions but also materiality of the objects. Um, where are these made from? What's the status of the materials used? And is there something like an iconography of material and um, what's the iconography depicted on some of the objects? Then um, what's the relation to other, maybe even secular treasuries or donations? And how do objects travel and do materials travel as well? And then workshop practices would also be something that you could look into in this uh, project. Um, to, uh, if, if you have anything to add, be my guest. Um, what I will be doing is I'll try to focus on women and gender as well here. And I will do so uh, by looking at the medieval treasury in Germany. And then I will again return to uh, Mathilde Plantagenet, so that's the woman also depicted on the poster, and other women and uh, looking into Spain with her sister, Leonor, and Infanta Sancha uh, before uh, Leonor. Um, what I, at the same time, will also be doing for a completely different project, but still uh, a bit related, is a project by Stephen Church uh, in England about the Angevin Empire, and I will be looking at gift exchange between the Angevin uh, kings and queens and 
the Holy Roman uh, emperors and empresses. And I think the connection between these two topics is that I look at the way objects function in social system. So that means that I will include the context of donations, the material used, the appreciation of materials, but also inscriptions and comparisons um, to similar uh, objects. To give an idea about Matilda's uh, treasures, um, you see here an image with a few objects from the Guelph treasury that used to be in Brunswick, Germany, not far from Berlin. Um, and this is a treasure that is consists of objects dated between the 11th and 15th centuries and the problem with this treasury is that it's often not clear who donated what and at what time. Um, so we don't know for sure if Matilda was involved because there are no objects stating Matilda had me made or Matilda donated me and there are a few uh, that can be related to her husband but the gospel book I just showed you gives indications that she was involved as it contains a poem or a text stating her involvement in the memory and fame of Brunswick and then gives some examples of what they did as a ducal couple. We do know that she donated stuff to uh, Hildesheim and um, here you have a poor quality black and white image from uh, the Liber Capitularis or chapter book from Hildesheim. This is a text stating the donation and here's the translation. Uh, it's a really fascinating uh, book actually because um, it was written down somewhere between the 12th and 15th century and it's quite complicated what entries, which entries were written uh, when exactly. Uh, but as you can see, the Matilda dedicated to our church, together with her husband Henry, gathered for our church very beautiful vestments decorated with gold and gold fringe, a white chasuble, a red chasuble, a white dalmatic, a red dalmatic, a white tunicle, a red tunicle, a stall of gold fringe together with a maniple, a dark red cape, a snow white cape, a single alb, a Greek censer, a completely golden woven altar cover and a more beautiful one embroidered with gold. In addition, another golden embroidered cover, two shrines and episcopal uh, sandals. Well, um, this entry raises questions that I've been thinking about and no definite answers yet. Um, what does it mean that Matilda's name is stated before that of her husband? <coughs> um, actually, it's uh, nice that we have a charter issued by her sister Leonor for Toledo, which has the same sort of clause. Toledo, the, uh, sorry, uh, Leonor donated this with, well, uh, together with her husband. What are the objects uh, that are mentioned here? These are vestments and vessels, all meant to be used uh, during liturgy. Um, then. Okay, it raised the question, is there a hierarchy in the way the objects are mentioned? If you have any ideas, let me know. I have no uh, idea yet. And then um, here, for example, is another entry, and there are many other entries. And the fascinating stuff is, and this will interest uh, Anna, is that they uh, usually contain landed wealth. So it's land, or mansions, or farmsteads and rarely objects, movable objects. Uh, sometimes there's a combination, but this one seems to stand out for the fact that it's only about movable objects. Um, and Julio might have ideas about why the rest of the page is blank, because uh, if it's a, like the manuscript is written in several stages, I was just wondering why some pieces are fully covered with text and others are not. I have not a clue yet. I need to find out what the dating exactly is and I also need to find out what information is actually in this book and what is not in this book. And are these donations only pro memoria or should we also uh, look differently um, to these uh, and similar entries. So this is one part of the research. The other one is the San Isidoro at Leon where uh, Leonor um, 
steps in. And it seems far to go from Hildesheim to Leon, but from a material and social perspective it is not. And the material perspective here is that uh, Leonor seems to have made a donation of vestments as well. <coughs> and Therese has also been working on uh, these uh, stoles or stole at the maniple. Now we'll come to that later. Uh, but first, um, Julio Gonzalez wrote a book on uh, Castile uh, during the reign of Alfonso VIII, and um, he emphasized uh, Leonor's domestic character, and she must have worked on these herself, like um, uh, Matilda did on the uh, Bayeux tapestry, the idea of women uh, and embroidery. But uh, Therese has pointed out there's no way of telling of Le that Leonor made these themselves, or that she donated them, uh, or what her exact involvement was. What Gonzalez did not mention were the inscriptions, and although he mentioned that they were in Leon, in the treasury, he didn't make any further comments on that as well. Well, what we do know, I think, is that the um, similarity between the textiles suggests that they originate from the same fabric. Maybe they're even made at the same time, although one wonders why the dates on the uh, fabrics are uh, different. Um, do they refer to uh, the time the, I don't know, the embroideries or the inscriptions were put on the materials, or do they refer to the date that the donation uh, was made? I think the latter is more likely. We also know from the inscription that it was for sure that Leonor was involved. She's here. Um, uh, I think it's one of the rare occasions actually that she stated as the daughter of the. Uh, of King Henry. Well, for Matilda, we encounter this all the time, uh, but for Leonor, ne not that often. There's also, it's also evident there's a Castilian connection, not only from the inscription, but also from the iconography uh, employed. And um, if we accept that she had these objects made, um, then it's probably also likely that she donated them around this time to as as Therese suggested, to the canons of uh, San Isidoro, although we cannot even be sure about that. I would, yeah, but it makes it all way more complicated. Um, then there are some other questions that, are, um, that remain. Um, Therese already elaborated on the Mefekit uh, part of the inscriptions, but also why San Isidoro? It was not an, not an important place to the kings of Castile at that moment. So why would they, what would the relation between Leonor and San Isidoro be? I found no reference to San Isidoro uh, in, or donations to San Isidoro in charter material. So might it be that their daughter uh, Berengula is the connection here? She um, married the king of Leon. So might this be a donation related to their wedding, uh, that was at this year, or to the birth and death of Beringla's first child, um, who was also buried at San Isador. And why textiles? Does it have any specific meaning? How common are these inscriptions? And does the placement of the inscriptions on the uh, stoles actually matter. I don't know, I still have no clue, but if you, they would be on the neck of the person wearing them. This, I would suggest, is it like Leonor held a grip over the cannon or whoever it was that wore this uh, stuff? I don't know, but it's worth thinking about. But then um, there's another, and sorry, I only have a very poor picture of it. There's another object related to a woman and San Isidoro, and it's a, probably a part of a portable altar um, commissioned by Infanta Sancha um, around 1144, and perhaps, I don't know, donated by her to the church. And um, this is a question. Um, well, this is the only one, uh, this is the only object that contains her name um, and can be related 
our liturgical object to San Isidoro. Um, and it would be interesting to find out what the rest of the object looked like. When you look now at the top of the object with an inscription stating Queen Sancha, daughter of Raimundo, has me made of silver. And then I didn't have a picture of it, but around the sides of this piece is also a long inscription with all the relics that were in the box that isn't there anymore, suggesting that this was the top or the lid of a box. Um, I thought this type of object is really uh, popular in the 11th and 12th centuries, and I will present one other example uh, that might give an idea of what the missing part of Sancha's portable altar have looked like, although it's much earlier. Sorry. It's this object, and I'm not suggesting that there is a straightforward connection between the two objects, but just that this more or less complete object might give an idea about Sancha's portable altar. It's a um, uh, um, portable altar commissioned by Countess Gertrude, also in Brunswick. She was actually the founder of the church at Brunswick, so Henry and Marcel were not the, the first ones involved uh, with the church. And uh, it's actually in combination with, probably made in combination with two crosses, which I don't show here. But um, what are the, uh, what do they have, what do the uh, altars have in common? Well, the top. Uh, it contains a stone, probably a coal fire stone, although I hope you see that the one by Infanta contains all sorts of pieces of stone or colors, and this is way more evenly colored. Um, it also tells us something about the size. The size of these two altars is about the same. But I've looked also at others, and the size varies enormously. So you can't say, okay, because this is a, that this is a general size. But it might suggest that um, Sancha's altar also might have been 10 centimeters high. And it also contains an inscription at the top, as we saw with Sancha, stating that it was uh, Gertrude who um, yeah, had it made and offered it to Christ. But I hope you uh, also see the differences between the two inscriptions. It's only Gertrude, no reference to her status as countess, no reference to that she was the daughter of somebody, just Gertrude, and this may, means that our historians have long thought, which Gertrude will it be? And then what I would also like you to show is that this actually held or holds pieces of uh, saints, um, and that they're not, that's not the lid, the top lid that functions as a lid, but it's actually in the bottom there's a hole, and that functions as the way to enter uh, the relics and also to get them out. Um, what do I. Okay, I think that if you would compare Sancha's leftover portable altar to other portable altars, you might get an idea of what the original features of Sancha's altar might have been, but also if it was um, custom made, did it fit her particular uh, needs, did it uh, perhaps reflect her interests, and I think that will give a fuller picture of um, Sancha's donation, but also a fuller picture of what um, um, how luxury items functioned and how uh, the aristocratic people used their objects and maybe traveled with them. And maybe it's even possible to suggest that they traveled across frontiers, what would be nice, fitting the theme of the project, because um, uh, this might be more an obsession of art historians, they always tend to um, think about objects as located in regional uh, workshops, so it must have been made in Saxony, it must have been made there and there, and that means that their comparison material often is also really locally. Um, having said this, I'm at the about to end my presentation. I think that my research, that the, the running thread is uh, women and gender, but also that my uh, research has 
developed it, which is good, I think. Uh, I would say that my earlier research focused on a visual culture, and that was mainly about representation and communication. And I used the word visual culture uh, purposely because um, art historians often study the big artworks that are really considered artworks, but I was also interested in other material objects like coins and seals that are considered minor arts. And I think that now I will be looking more in to women in treasuries, which includes other objects such as textiles, but also the movement of objects and women and the connections between objects and women. Um, and I think that would be sort of the shift in uh, my research. Um, um, I'm looking forward to receiving your comments and questions later on, because uh, I hope you have some ideas you would like to share with me or maybe some questions. Thanks.